goes for fashion and retail in India. To shed a little light on the subject, uh, our panelists for today, Mrs. Sake Thankar, um, Ms. Kanchan Thingra, and um, Mr. Nachiket Parve. Mr. Sake Thankar is head of IMG Reliance. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for having me here. I'm delighted to be talking to you on fashion retail. I've been working for more than 10 years in this space now, and it's quite exciting to be working in this space. Just to give you a brief idea of my background, I did engineering from our neighborhood IIT Bombay, and then I went on to do my MBA from IIM Calcutta. So with that kind of, uh, you know, with that kind of professional and technical education, I landed in the field of fashion. So for last 10 years, I've been working in the business of fashion. So I will uh, try to take a very technical and a mathematical view of fashion, which I would love to explain to you. And because we have uh, Nachiket also in the panel, I will not like to touch the design space of it. So I will like to focus my energies more on the market, on the business, and on the supply chain part of it. I have uh, five slides. Uh, just to uh, set context for the apparel market in India, and uh, just to let you know about the size, the domestic uh, apparel market right now is 1,25,000 crores. It's supposed to grow four times in next 10 years. So we are looking at a huge market. How the market is segmented is that, uh, first of all, it is segmented in Western wear and ethnic wear. Then the Western, Western wear apparel market is segmented in ready to wear and tailored. And the ready to wear market is segmented in branded and unbranded. So I'm going to restrict myself to the Western ready to wear branded market, which is a huge uh, 18,000 crores. And this is, uh, this is the space that all of us are likely to operate in. Uh, in terms of how this uh, how this market is segmented is economy and popular uh, segment where typically a men's uh, shirt would be uh, less than 1000 rupees we have the premium segment where the shirts are from 1500 to 2500 super premium is 2500 to 4000 and uh, a men's shirt priced more than 4000 comes in luxury uh, segment so essentially the luxury and the super premium part of the market is about 2,000 crores and the premium uh, segment which we see in the malls that we go is about 4,000 crores. So this is a huge market. It's going to uh, get four times in the next 10 years. Now what this chart essentially tells you is that it's a large growing market with multiple players and multiple brands and international brands uh, entering the market. So as far as the brand space is concerned, it's cluttered and there are huge offerings for every consumer. As far as if and all of us understand fashion and from the consumer side that the consumers have huge, uh, they have their own, uh, they have their own preferences, they have their own uh, emphasis on variety, newness, and they come from different regions, they have their regional tastes. So just to marry uh, these brands with the Indian consumer, it gets done by something called fashion retail and that is what makes fashion retail so exciting. The complex and the exciting world of fashion retail essentially has five variables in play and you need to get all five of them right if you want to sell your product to the customer. So the first part is the merchandise, which means essentially uh, there are two parts to the merchandise. First is the design part and second is the supply chain. So you might be a good designer or you might, be, you might have a brilliant design or a uh, product, but you also need to deliver it to the right consumer at, in the right size at the right place. So that is what we mean by supply chain. And I'll be taking you through uh, essentially the supply chain part of the business because I believe that uh, most of the designers, they lack in terms of the supply chain. In terms of pricing, uh, we all understand from consumer perspective what pricing means. Uh, to sell a product, the value equation, the price value equation of a product should meet the consumer needs. Only then the purchase will happen. In terms of experience, we talk about visual merchandising, we talk about lighting of a store, we talk about the store facade, so all those things comes part of the experience. In terms of convenience, we look at the format of store that you want, whether you want your own store, you want to have a franchisee store, you want to enter a trade channel through multi-branded outlets, so all those things are considered. And the last thing is the customer, where you focus on your brand imagery, you try to segment your brands and you want to get relevant footfalls in your store. For example, if a person visits a Louis Vuitton store, 
and if he asks why is this bag priced at 1 lakh rupees then that is not the relevant customer for that brand so essentially what i'm trying to say is if you have to make uh, if you have to sell your product to a customer you need to get uh, all these uh, boxes need to be ticked and all these boxes need to be in place so that the final purchase happens and because of this multi variable our business is so exciting and thrilling and i can say having worked for more than 10 years i am still learning the tricks of the trade so uh, now assuming that all of you are an expert in fashion design i will quickly move on to the supply chain because this is one area which i feel is a critical success factor and uh, so this is a traditional supply chain uh, an apparel supply chain which is about one year uh, which is a, which is about one year uh, lasts for one year and this is what makes the thing complex uh, let me take you through the best practices of a supply chain so first of all we start with something called a range architecture where uh, which is let's say one year before the season starts so uh, we we start working one year before the season starts we do market intelligence uh, we do we look at the key macro trends we look at the business plan so we want to ensure that our brand will grow faster than the market is growing we will grow faster than the competition so all those things so the targets are set one year before the season starts this is extremely critical and this will result in a buy plan uh, so once once you've decided that we will need x number of options and these quantities you uh, you give the brief or the range architecture to the design team now the design team does uh, i'm sure you you understand the design part of it the design team uh, after doing their capturing trends by visiting fashion capitals fairs through wgsn they come up with 2x options so if x is the number of options required in a season they come up with 2x number of options and they present it in a in a uh, in a process called book and make so in a book and make essentially a brand invites all its store manager all its channel partners all uh, relevant consumer panels all of them are invited and those 2x options are shown to uh, to the entire uh, book and make panel all of them they select for first of all they select x options out of 2x options and second is they select quantities for each style so at the end of the book and make your buy plan is made and you give your buy plan which comprises of uh, quantities for each sku to your sourcing and merchandising team so this is so 6 months so 4 months are gone now 6 months are left you have your buy plan and you start Uh, you start sourcing for the fabrics so you source the fabrics you have a database of about 100 manufacturing vendors and you start making products so once the products come in warehouse it's about one month to go for the season then again a complex mathematical exercise gets done which is called deployment essentially you have the entire range but you need to deploy Uh, for each store you need to deploy the right uh, design the right uh, product in its relevant sizes so that is a that is a huge uh, mathematical exercise which we all call deployment is very critical uh, to send the right product to the right store just to take you through various supply chain uh, models that we have uh, you know which are uh, which are again best practices we have something called quick response supply chain so what we are trying to say is that this is the traditional supply chain this is 10 months but right now so this can only cover 50% of your products but you need to have parallel supply chains running with this so that you can ensure newness and variety in your stores so we have something called a quick response model wherein uh, uh, it is mathematically now proven that the best forecasting for a sell through of a style can be done by taking into account the initial the initial sales for the first 5 days of a style so this quick response is based on the initial demand for that style so once once the product goes in stores after 5 or 10 days you take the sales and you extrapolate those sales and if your quantity is short uh, is uh, short of that number then you start making so your supply chain has to be geared up to make that product in 2 months so that is something called quick response we uh, also call something uh, as a delayed differentiation which is taking the call closer to the season so rather than taking a call let's say 10 months in advance we can delay certain critical decisions like color uh, fits and quantities so how benetton does it is that they make their crew necks for example from a gray fabric and they color it closer to the season depending on the trends we have something called fast fashion which is what zara does 
So fast fashion essentially means postponing your buy and taking a call closer to the season. So fast fashion is not a self-sufficient supply chain. It can comprise 10 to 20% of your entire product portfolio. So let's say your core products can come from the traditional supply chain, whereas your fast fashion products, they need to come through a different supply chain, which is much more vertically integrated so that you can manufacture products within two months time. There is something, a concept called flash collection and stock lots, which essentially means you are collaborating with mills and whatever fabrics they are left with, you, you tie up with them. So you save on three months of fabric sourcing and you can take those fabrics and you can, uh, you can, uh, uh, you can manufacture shirts out of them and you can start selling them. So this is also a quick way. Uh, I don't recommend this because this essentially depends on the stock which is left with a meal. Then the next concept is called just-in-time manufacturing, wherein what we do is that rather than if, suppose we have bought fabric for 500 shirts, we only make 300 shirts and the remaining 200 uh, meters is with us. Only when the sales happen, we start converting that fabric into shirts. So this is something called just-in-time manufacturing. So in case the shirt bombs or the sell-throughs are not good, you can utilize that fabric for something else. Book and Make, I've already explained to you, where you use the help of your store managers, your channel partners, uh, consumer panels to, uh, to, and to uh, forecast for you how many pieces you can sell in each SKU. So these are the various models that we use in supply chain so that, so that we have higher sell-throughs so that was that was a small uh, small concept of supply chain. Let me now uh, tell you ten best practices for fashion brands that I feel are extremely critical. The first is that every brand, uh, we need to choose the retail format for a democratic presence. Okay, it can be a multi-brand, it can be a multi-channel, multi-format. So what I'm trying to say is that we right now are having our stores in malls which means that everyone is entering the malls so it is extremely difficult for us to segment consumers so for a for a fashion brand it is critical that we have a democratic presence we cover a wider spectrum of consumers in terms of price points in terms of product offerings and in terms of fashion sensibilities so uh, just to give you one example of how a brand can uh, do it by having various sub brands is hugo boss for example so Hugo Boss has five sub-brands, which is the black label, the orange, the green, the Boss Selection, and the Hugo. So, so if you combine the portfolio of all these five products, they cover a wider spectrum of consumer preferences, price points, and product portfolio in terms of the fashion f design. So you can have multiple brands. You can decide to retail through multiple channels. While your own stores give you a good experience to the consumer, the the trade partners the, the the trade channel is much more profitable than your own stores and the trade also makes your brand uh, uh, available in various cities multiple formats so you you can also have different formats for your stores you can also look at franchisee stores in tier 2 and 3 markets so this thing is extremely critical uh, for you to be successful second is clarify margin model and product assortment for each format now, for if you are there, let's say in, in an Oberoi mall, if you have your own store also, and if you are selling through a central also, you need to ensure that there are different price points in, 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 both, in both the stores, and there are different products which are there in the different stores. Because the consumer who is walking into a central is very different from who will be walking into your store. So it is extremely critical that we clarify. Now, when we, when we have our own stores, we have... Uh, we, we, the gross margins are higher, but obviously the store operating costs are huge. But when we are uh, with a trade partner, uh, the, the, it, the trade channel is more profitable because they pass, the store operating cost gets divided across brands. Manage SKU proliferation. It is very tempting for a fashion brand to give you uh, the same style in two collars or in two sleeve lengths or two shirt lengths or, uh, you know, or in odd sizes or let's say extra large sizes. But what it certainly does is that it makes your supply chain, uh, it is a burden on your supply chain, and uh, it also reduces the uh, number of options in a store. So you will be sitting on a huge tip, but the number of options in a store would be very less, and when consumers come looking for newness or variety, that gets compromised. One typical problem with which all Indian brands have is that they have not been able to uh, sort out their core portfolio. So what we mean by, uh, so uh, the, the entire product offering of all the fashion brands gets divided into a core products, which 
which forms about 60% of the offering. Then there is a current season products, which is about 30%. And we have something which is very extremely fashion forward, which should be about 10%. What we, what we see in terms of Indian brands is that this, this thing is not categorized clearly and most of them either they attempt everything which is fashion forward or everything which is extremely basic. So a, a, a clear balance needs to be established by fashion brands in terms of their product portfolio and core needs to be 50 to 60% of the range. We need to design our supply chain to put the core products on automatic replenishment and all the design and the fashion forward styles need to be made as per the order. We need to ensure dynamic, a uh, lot of brands, they wait for the entire four or five month season and they go on sale at the end of the season. But what it is a proven fact that something which is not sold in the first four weeks is not going to sell even later. So it is much better that you correct the price value equation by offering a minimum discount on that and try to sell it in the initial part because it is much better to sell it right now at 15% rather than selling it after six months at 50% off. Again, brands, they feel shy of doing this, but the international brands, they are smart and they, in one corner of their store, they put brands on sale. We need to protect opening price points, good, better, best. We need to have a clear price point ladder for our uh, product offerings. The end, uh, so, so how a entry price point works is it invites uh, customers to the stores, it invites younger customers to gain experience. Uh, People, for an aspirational brand, it is important that younger customers come and experience that brand. So I'm sure you've seen the mango crew neck t-shirts at extremely affordable prices. So, so it is extremely critical to have an uh, opening pr price point. You need to protect it strongly through a strong core product. And you need to have a price ladder, which let's say, in, in case of India, let's say if you're starting at 700 rupees, it should go up to as much as six to 7,000 rupees because all kind of customers are walking into your store, so you should cover a wider price uh, offering. Create style and occasion. The Indian uh, shoppers are, uh, they are functional in, ter in terms of their shopping behavior, and also uh, they shop on occasions. For example, marriage is one season where they really shop. So as a brand and as a marketing team, I think the idea should be how to uh, educate your styles through coordinated looks. You need to get ensure that the style of your consumers evolve over a period of time. So visual merchandising, product coordinated looks, product communication, in-store marketing uh, offers, all of them play an important role in uh, creating style and occasion for your brand. Each front-end sales staff to own 100 core customers. Your core customers are very important until unless you have 50% of your business coming from your repeat purchases, you will not be profitable. The cost of acquiring a new customer is much, much more than, uh, than uh, selling it to the retained customer. So that can only be done if your sales team has knows what each of your customer wants and is continuously engaging with them. Be famous for something, again, extremely important. None of the Indian brand does it. Uh, you need to be known for something. Either, so you can be known for your product. For example, Gap is known for chinos. You have Lacoste known for its colorful polos. You have Diesel known for its attitude. But none of the Indian brand, for example, has been known, uh, is, has focused on this. But this is extremely critical in a fragmented market where there are hundreds of brands and every mall has 200 stores. It is extremely important that you be famous for something. So those were just 10 uh, thoughts that I had on the best practices if you have a fashion retail brand. Uh, this is my last slide just on the marketing part of it. Uh, so uh, let me just take you through the various uh, marketing vehicles that can be used by a fashion retail brand and why are they used. So first is the mass media which is print, TV and holdings which we call above the line in the marketing jargon. And this type of communication is generally used for building reach, so reaching to larger audience and for your salience. Salience is your brand recall. So the above the line is extremely expensive, but it certainly gives you the reach and salience. So if you have, let's say, 40, 80 stores across India, then I certainly advise you to use this medium. Suppose if you have a luxury label or if you are a designer, then my suggestion to you is to go for a below the line or a CRM below the line marketing activation which is which is targeted to that person so above the line is where I'm putting a holding and I'm communicating to everyone but below the line is for example I send a uh, I send a mailer to Nachiket saying that 
this is the gift voucher for you please come to my store and buy so i'm only talking to him i am not talking to everyone else so this is uh, this is something called below the line extremely effective and the the ch chances of acquiring are also much higher through a below the line communication a lot of brands they do event sponsorships it gives them a high ground so will slice style india fashion week for example implies will slice style is a fashionable brand so which implies that when you walk into the will slice style store you expect something out of the world then there are new media which is coming up for example we have digital media which is website it is extremely important for us to share our brand content and to share our ideas and whatever we are doing to our consumers this is the new marketing mantra that needs to be done through our websites social media is taking that one step forward so rather than sharing we also need to listen to what our consumers are saying so it's more of a dialogue that happens through social media pr certainly helps in terms of in terms of luxury and designer labels it is the it creates a positive word of mouth and one customer obviously tells it or one patron of your brand tells it and gets 10 more customers so the chances of acquiring customers the cost is the cheapest in terms of fpr exercise store facade now a mall has 200 stores so for a customer to enter your store the store facade obviously needs to be uh, needs to be impressive so a lot of brands are spending nowadays on visual merchandising also in store communication so you might get relevant footfalls but for them to ensure that they buy a product from your store you need to and for conversion you need to have you need to ensure that whatever the designers have conceptualized okay that gets communicated to the consumer in the right kind of experience so once you do that then only the conversion happens so 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 integrated marketing mix also means that all the all the channels of marketing need to tell the same thing it should not be that in, in on tv you are saying something else on social media you are saying something else on in in the store you are saying something else so for example if you have done a collection on eco on let's say eco style for example so your tv ad needs to be on eco style your store window needs to be on eco style you need to be uh, on social media also you need to be talking about eco style and the products available in the store should also form a major part of the eco style collection so that is what we mean by integrated marketing wherein what the designers thought one year before when we when they started conceptualizing when they identified that yes eco style was a major trend that gets that gets that is brought alive into the retail environment through all these marketing vehicles and that is where, when customers will get excited to buy something which is eco style and they'll come walk into your store and they'll buy eco style so with that uh, i think that is all i had to say thank you very much for listening to me thank you so much saket for uh, you know the insights you gave us and i want uh, to ask that you get the question and this question is in two parts so first part being that uh, you know today we are in an age where you know the opportunity for designers is the maximum because of digital media and also because so many stores coming in fdi coming in at the same time it's also the the competition at the highest because there are so many fashion schools which are opening up and there are so many designers that are there in, you know, which are competing with each other. So one is, how does a designer today differentiate you know, him or herself in this environment? Uh, secondly, also, what are the key challenges that are currently faced by designers? So how many of you here want to be fashion entrepreneurs or launch your own label? Let me just raise your hand. Quite a significant number. So, you know, it's, I think, after listening to different sides of the story, I think it's a little like, you know, seven blind men and the elephant. And the elephant is jogging at a rapid pace and metamorphosizing. So it's really a little bit of luck by chance, a lot of hard work, a lot of passion. And it's a tough journey, like Kanchan said, you know, if you are in it for keeps, only then should you go ahead with it. I was recently reading, you know, he's my favorite ar artist, Vincent Van Gogh. And he sold only one painting in his lifetime. Fortunately, fashion doesn't work like that. What we create is art, but it also is, has a lot of commerce thrown in. So what you do, I think, is only valid if people wear it. If it's just something which is, you know, fawned about and bloggers wearing it to uh, fashion weeks and, you know, fawning and gushing and five celebrities wearing it. Yeah, I mean, it, it does create a social impact, but for an organization to be built for a style to grow and it's, it's a very cash intensive business. So it's important that your clothes sell, sell well and you build a very, very solid customer base. It's my seventh year in fashion and it's, it really feels like a lot longer. But I think what it me it involves is also uh, like Sakhir said, you know, and I wish our 
the Indian fashion industry was so organized. I mean, within these six and a half years that I've seen changes, it's changed massively, it's changed rapidly and I still feel, you know, it's a very, very volatile environment which changes con continuously. Like when we started, I, I did my debut at Lakme Fashion Week Gen Next and I was, I had studied uh, design at NID and, you know, done a, I had a scholarship to go study in Paris at NSAD. And I came back and, you know, had a, like a year's uh, experience of working in India and all it had equipped me was to do good design and have a sense and a, and a clearly defined point of view, which perhaps set the label in terms of what uh, gave it a distinct identity. But I had no idea what consignment was, what outright was. So I, I must have a confession here. It's in my first season, a very, very uh, famous Tony store from Bombay came to me and said, you know, uh, well, you know, we don't really launch everybody and we are launching you, but you will have to give us an exclusive in Bombay on consignment and we will fix the MRP. I mean, that is harakiri, like it's like somebody telling, you know, taking you on the top of Chrysler building and saying, jump. This parachute is hidden somewhere. So, you know, from then it's been a lot of challenges and Kanchana and I have our little, you know, uh, uh, to and fro's in terms of terms and payments and how do we do it. But I, I think everybody has their challenges. It's also about working. It is, it is a partnership because what you create is ultimately has to be on the backs of people. It has to be sold in an environment which which nourishes the product, which which sort of communicates your concept right to the customer. Because not only that's how you generate revenue, but that's how you build a brand. For your for A, it's important to have something unique to say. Secondly, it, it's important that those clothes be worn. You know, I, I have never had a PR person. But you have the strangest person, like I once went to IFA in Colombo as a guest, and there was one lady in a nightclub dan dancing in a corner from Sri Lanka who is wearing a garment of mine she had bought in Chennai. So your clothes will be your message. But it's important that you're willing to be realistic about it, to have a context. And as it becomes more and more competitive now, I think it's important to not take shortcuts and have a story to tell. Have something which is original. See, I mean, the only thing which will differentiate you from the market is you yourself. Hopefully there's no clones of you running around in different countries or different parts of the city. So if you have a mind of your own, if you have the gumption to sort of believe in yourself, invest in yourself and believe in the challenges are endless. It's like, you know, it's, it's like juggling hot coals every day on your hands. So you think ek khatam ho gaya, something else, like, it's like Medusa, you chop one head off, the other head pops up and it never changes. And I think after six years of losing sleep and, you know, having all these stress attacks over it, I've come to realize that's how it's always going to be. And maybe there'll be three Medusas on three sides. But if you believe in yourself and if you have a dream, you really have to fight for it because nobody else is going to do it for you. Basically, when you started your own designer store, so there may be a point when you go to a mall, there are like number of designers that are in line with you. So there's a competing market over here. And they all are growing in a very much with a bigger scale. For example, I'm you opening a design store, beside you there's one more other store is coming up and it's competing with you. So at that time, at initial point when you started, so what was your, how did you compete? What was your company strategy or marketing and sales? So, how do you deal with that? Can you share that? Uh, well, uh, specifically talking about Chamomile in its current location, we are the only multi designer store at Palladium. Uh, so, therefore, we didn't have the challenge of, challenge of other multi designer stores. However, uh, there were many other designer stores. I think uh, one doesn't need to worry about competition. Uh, if one is clear about A, what their brand communication is, B, uh, about, uh, you know, uh, having your own um, sort of being true to your customers. I think that's what the es essence of the whole thing is, being true to your customers and making sure that whatever your brand stands for and one of the things like for example like when new stores emerge i see a lot of new quirky and edgy trends coming up and then when i look at them i say no but this doesn't agree with the philosophy of chamomile and even at the time when we uh, conceptualized the brand the very name chamomile meant a few things for us it meant a very sublime shopping experience you know it was a a place and I don't know if you've seen the interiors of our store right from the Delhi store to the store in Khar to the store at Palladium have won awards for their interiors it's been you know you usually like spaces covered in white natural materials uh, we've always tried to keep 
a very very friendly staff and a uh, not snooty staff which is usually associated with very luxury stores and i've had that experience i don't know if you've had so i think this is these are some of the things that camomile stood for also pricing uh, it has been a very very challenging task but we've tried to keep the pricing as conscientious as possible literally sometimes for every 200 or 300 rupees fighting with our designers and saying why can't you bring the price of this down so if i feel that if that happens uh, then no matter how many people there are in your vicinity you know like uh, i don't know what your favorite brands are but my favorite brands are like like for example fab india i love that brand or i love in the space of salons i love be blunt no matter how many uh, salons open next to be blunt or fab india uh, uh, st stores next to fab india i would still go there because i know what that brand stands for so that's what we tried to do in the beginning and i think we were largely successful uh so that's what i would say i think being true to what you are and to your customers really helps you go a long way uh, can you go light on something about the changing media habits can you talk about the in last slide what are the changing media habits when you open a store or you have a multiple brand so what are what can adaptation into it so what are the changing habits of the media first of all let me tell you what are the changing uh, in term in terms of media uh, the demographics are changing people are becoming younger so your consumer is becoming younger then there is a lot of clutter in the media space for example uh, you know print is all clutter you've seen uh, the credibility of print is being uh, questioned for example uh, tv is becoming hugely expensive okay so fashion competes with uh, with other uh, other industries and i have for example not seen too many fashion ads on tv so tv is too expensive for fashion brands print is uh, cluttered and you know doesn't have the credibility so these are the challenges which are there in the media space so what fashion is doing is it is moving on to digital and social media because they uh, because the 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 quality of engagement which happens over social media is much more uh, i mean is much better than how they can you know communicate through the above the line media so so this is my answer to your uh, how things are changing in the media world second is if you are launching a new store if you are launching a new store i think the i and assuming you have only one store then obviously you have to do something called which is a cashment specific marketing so for example if i had one store let's say in palladium mall then obviously i'll restrict myself to the to the palladium mall environment and also i will do lot of below the line activations i will invite lot of people to come and experience my store so i'll be sending them gift vouchers i'll be sending them uh, you know targeted activations customized uh, personalized mailers for example to invite them to my store and uh, so that is one so i would want to acquire more customers to my store second is people who are walking in organically who are part of the mall and are walking in initially i will offer them some incentive to buy so that i get a customer based mail so so whereas i am acquiring customers i am also ensuring whosoever walks into my store at that point of time for first two months there is a offer like if you shop for 20000 rupees then we give you a 2000 rupees off or something so some incentive is there for people who are walking in on their own to get converted uh, third third kind of marketing which gets done is something called cross navigation in a mall for example you do a tie up with some let's say if you have a designer store then you do a tie with a jewelry store and you cross navigate customers to each other so so that in in a, in case of a new store the marketing gets restricted to the cashment i just want to add like when saket was talking about his presentation i think now what happens also india is such a uh, unique market like everybody has been saying you have somebody who is extremely fashion conscious well traveled knows their brands knows quality and is willing to pay for it and then you have somebody who wants all of that but doesn't want to pay for it or doesn't care if it's a original or a copy so i think while we cater to a niche even that niche is very wide and you really have to define who's your core customer because if you try to please them all you know it just dilutes itself and kills itself a little bit i think so this is just a little bit about the the business side of it so your uh, your your design your design will have a value and then the the value would be also based on exclusivity like like she said so 
uh, you shouldn't, the market shouldn't be flooded with it. It should be available everywhere. It should be available enough to match the value. So how do you get that value volume ratio right for a new or an upcoming label or a brand up to a point where it becomes a brand? You know, you know, so once it becomes a brand, then I guess the value can go pretty much up. See, as a fashion entrepreneur in India, I think you know you pretty much are having eight hats at one point of time. So you you're the designer, you are the financer, you are the marketer, you are the PR person, you are everything. So I think it's is of course through trial and error, but it's also by having a a strong sense of intuition and also having a constant dialogue with your partners. I mean, I mean, Kanchan can watch. You know, we hear over all the time saying, you know, what are the sales? What is the feedback? Yeah. So unless you're constantly be talking to the editors, be talking to the stores, it's being open to feedback because they will tell you. <coughs> At least some of them will tell you because you know. Otherwise, how do you? You can't have your. You can't be in eight different places at every point of time. So and being again like quick in your actions, in terms of or reactions rather. So if you feel something is not working well, how do you change? Maybe you sort of you know it's a little like shooting in the dark at times. But something hits somewhere, and you know you have to be receptive, open, and willing to change. How would you try and fix the value volume ratio? So, value is the the the, the cost of the design, yeah. and the volume is the amount of design that's available, yes. the, the number of spaces. Yeah, sure. So, how do you get that right? That that mix. Well, for me, um, I would say that firstly, once we know that this is our core product, okay, and uh, based on. Uh, customer feedback from let's say x uh, period of time which shows clearly that this is what customers are coming to our store for mainly and these are the top three categories that customers really want i think uh, at that point and secondly also observation of what price points sell so for me it's not like i have any uh, i have to do any uh, quite honestly any balance between value and uh, volume i can i can have both uh, we have had experiments with higher pr price points at our store, but we realized that they were not succeeding because uh, customers were not willing to pay beyond a certain point at the kind of location that we were, or based on their imagery of what chamomile was. So typically for us, we have been successful in the, uh, say, say 7,000 to 50,000 price point and not beyond that, which I know they'd be happy to probably shell out at another store, 2 lakhs and in excess of that. So uh, for us, it's just been about uh, knowing what those categories are and uh, making sure that we have enough uh, depth and assortment in that category. So like r off late, we, ha we were having huge challenges in the area of sizing. Therefore, there were certain designers with whom we only ordered, you know, extra larges and things like that. And so I think I'll tell you, I'll give you a very interesting example of how we actually did it. We created six customer prototypes where I told the girls in my store, sketch me six different kinds of women and give them different descriptions. Here's this 22 year old girl who comes and she shops for Nishka Lola's stuff. She's like this, she's slim. She likes something which is more, you know, glamorous. And then make me this other woman who's this corporate woman and they were all real women. And then we said, okay, do I have enough for her? Do I have enough for her? And so that's how we design. You know, we're a very small company, so ours is definitely a very mad, sort of a very intuitive way of doing things, I would say. <laughs> Not a very, <laughs> you know, uh, like, you know what I mean? We're a small yeah. company and that's how we operate. We're so I hope company, that answers what you... a small company that makes a very big impact in a very short time. So I'm hearing intuition, I'm hearing shooting in the dark. And I was actually looking at, so research or uh, you know documentation that the industry has or industry bodies have that would enable commencement of brand growth of brand up to a point you know looking at value pricing uh, you know I'll just add a little funny anecdote and it's funny I'm saying it both Saket and Kanchan here about when I was in my second season, Lakme Fashion Week had organized a seminar with retailers and uh, designers in, in the auditorium of like somewhere at the back of NCPA. I think my second season itself, yes. And it was a little like the meeting at the God, of the Godfather, you know, because there were all these big daddies of retail sitting on stage and the designers just went and attacked them like crows. They were like, at that point, nobody was buying outright. See, my, like I understand the store's challenges. We offer flexible percentages or whatever, but 
it's important that whoever at least the bigger stores if your product is worth it they have to believe in you and put their money where their mouth is if you are on consignment it will be forever tucked away in the back of the store ha we have it we have it abhi aaj hi andar dala kal hi andar dala all the bullshit you hear but the point is you are investing hard earned money into the product let them also invest something in it so when you are talking of a industry body unfortunately with designers there is still you know it's like it's it's very sad but maybe you can count like eight people in in from the designers who i can actually have a conversation with the heart to heart otherwise it's just it's a little like crabs because now everybody's like are uska big jayega are what is look at bloody 1 billion people 1.2 billion people in the market what only eight dresses they want to buy like get over it you know so unless there is that some sort of a solidarity between and i think why should it be even retailers against designers everybody as a industry like look at the cfda you know you have to grow it together because the market is huge and we all like you know it's like one pan stall in a large buffet a wedding everybody is fighting on the one bloody stupid pan stall there's the whole buffet to cater to but till that happens it will take time and i think this designer like you, aaj everybody like you know across generations has to put it together because otherwise there is no end to it you know and i, I keep telling my interns you know you said it's intuition and logic and hard work and neeta said madness Whoever interns with me after two months, ask them. Are you getting dreams of tailors and clothes at 3 a.m.? Then you are right. So there is no easy way out. You know, you just cannot. Yeah. My question is for Kanchan. Uh, could you share your view on how multi-brand uh, could be helpful for budding designers, Indian budding designers? It's the place to be. Uh, because uh, I'll give you an example. Um, we are always on the lookout for emerging talent. Uh, and i'm speaking on behalf of the multi designer fashion retail industry uh, one of the things that we did last year was uh, we did it we sponsored an event at a fashion institute and the two award winning designers uh, whose final collections were according to us the most commercially viable and the most creative were given a chance to retail straight out of their you know they they had just finished college belly 19 or 20 years old and they were retailing at camomile so i think uh, it's about a designer's own originality uh, talent and all of that jazz and uh, then you will find avenues so uh, i think i i covered all of that and what are the things that you really need to look out for what are the things that you need to hone in yourself and uh, multi designer retail because for uh, then for the designer there is there are no additional overheads of of putting your product out there you've already got a platform to you know to launch it uh, but then you have to be very careful with the kind of place you this is what i mentioned in my presentation that you need to be careful that your identity synchronizes with the identity of that uh, multi brand location that is something you need to be careful about does that answer the question you know what she said is very correct because like even we've experience where a certain collection has done exceedingly well in some stores and certain stores are just not sold at all so unless you find that match it's not going to work you know and of course it has to be because like i mentioned at the beginning unless your clothes sell they have no validity i mean if you have like a certificate from a school saying most creative collection and it's hanging in your room it that's not how you grow a brand you know also i think uh, for f certainly for a new designer a multi brand uh, retail store certainly makes sense because first of all you're getting a platform from where you can showcase your collection second is uh, you know uh, the the shopper behavior in a multi uh, designer store is different you get more of a comparative shopper who will compare uh, who will compare all the products so there is a in case you are talented there is a big chance that you will stand out and you will uh, traffic or let's say sales of some other designer you will eat into sales of some other designer so the chances of you growing faster in a multi brand store are much higher and you can use that feedback and then you can build on to your label so i think for first two years it's extremely critical that you be there in these stores so that you get a feedback on your sales you can you get direct comparisons with other designers and you also get consumer feedback whereas for a for a young designer to open his or her own store is extremely difficult and you know it, and it feels amazing because forget about the, just the money coming in the fact that so many people are willing to pay their hard earned cash for your clothes over somebody else's and wear those clothes with pride is a very very good feeling so my question is for chiket sir uh, you've been a part of hot couture in paris when you've been scholarship there right 
So I'm so much into it actually, and the reason I want to know the question is that that what's the basic difference between the hot couture in Paris or in any other fashion country than India? The Paris hot couture is something which is a great facade to sell close to some 150 women worldwide who are willing to pay like three crores for a dress and sell lots of perfume and lipstick at airports. The haute couture in India is actually sold to clients who are looking for a 10 lakh lenga to get married in. So I think it's really important to get a reality check before you step out. Because there's a time when I was in Paris where I wanted to become the next Valentino. And then very quickly after coming I realized that it's a Valentino is good that he's retired and gone now. But here there's a much more dynamic market which you ought to tap. Or, or you go straight to bridal. I mean, if you, like, you know, so many young designers, I see them sketching these ostrich feather gowns and beautiful things. Name, where are you going to wear it? Are you going to wear it to the Oberoi for dinner? Are you going to wear it to the Umed Bhavan Palace? Where, see, clothes, it's not just clothes. Clothes need a life that they can fit into. So unless you doing all these beautiful velvet ball gowns, where is the ball? <laughs> so, you know, so look at life and create clothes for life. They're not in an imaginary context. I just want to add to this that when, you know, when we get new designers that approach our store and we tell them, why don't you send us your collection, they send us their uh, runway pictures and for, it's a good uh, understanding for us to see, okay, this is the kind of sensibility they have, but what is the product that you're going to be actually putting on the rack? It has to be different and modified and a tapered down version of what you show on the, on the ramp. So, you know. Thank you, thank you very much for this panel.